Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for the first plenary of the 2021 Pathways to Prosperity Conference. My name is Omed Majid, and I'm the Executive Director of SESHA, the Saskatchewan Settlement Umbrella. First and foremost, we at SESHA acknowledge that we operate on Treaty 2, Treaty 4, Treaty 5, and Treaty 6 territory, the traditional gathering land of 31 Indigenous peoples and the homeland of the Métis. We reaffirm our relationship with the Indigenous peoples of this territory, as this is an important part of our history and an important part of our future. Uh, so before I introduce to you the panelists in the session a little bit, I would like to just begin with a quick housekeeping reminder. Uh, if you have any questions for any of the panelists during their presentation, you can submit those questions through the right-hand column directly on the feed loop platform. And after the presentations, I'll share your questions with the panelists uh, for their response. Uh, and then we can go from there. So once again, welcome everyone. Thanks for, uh, for joining us here. It's really quite an honor for me to host the first session of the conference on acknowledging and defeating racism and Islamophobia in Canada, the path ahead. This is an incredibly important topic to me as growing up as a Muslim in Canada in a post 9-11 world definitely came with its fair share of challenges. And I do remember very clearly what life was like on September 10th, 2001 and how quickly everything changed one day later. And more specifically, how quickly everyone around me became a so-called expert on my religion. I remember that growing up and those conversations and those comments that I'd received as a young boy um, will always stick with me. Just over 20 years have passed since 9-11 and the rhetoric and stereotypes that have been pushed through the media, film and divisive politics shows us that Islamophobia won't just disappear on its own. The devastating and horrific tragedy that happened just over a year ago in London, Ontario, where a family of four was senselessly and tragically killed simply for what they believe in, shows us that we still have much, much work to do. As a society and as a country, we need to actively speak out against and combat Islamophobia at its roots and really work together to dismantle any form of racism or discrimination to any marginalized groups. This is our strength as a sector, and this is for sure how we have to move forward together. So with that, I'm very excited to introduce to you our first panelist for the session, Manel Mahtani. Manel is Brenda and David McLean Chair in Canadian Studies at University of British Columbia, where she is an Associate Professor at the Institute for Social Justice. She is an award-winning broadcaster, journalist, and nonfiction writer. Her book, May It Have a Happy Ending, is forthcoming with Doubleday and will explore the means through which journalists can employ anti-colonial approaches to challenge the rigid restraints of the normative racial hierarchy and mainstream media. She plans to provide an excerpt from her book today, and she was a finalist for the National Magazine Award and Digital Publishing Award, and her intellectual work has traced multiracial neoliberal formations as evidenced through her book, Mixed Race Amnesia, and her co-edited book, Global Mixed Race. So with that, I would like to welcome Manel. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmed, and uh, assalamu alaikum, and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, this piece is a little unusual, so I'm just going to warn you in advance, um, and it really is a kind of piece of auto theory, auto fiction. Darling, you feel heavy because you're too full of truth. Open your mouth more. Let your truth exist somewhere other than inside your body. That's a quote from Della Hicks Wilson. This is a story about silences. It is what happens to us when we repress our burgeoning truths about Islamophobia, racism, systemic oppression, the cost that we pay, and what it means to address that silence through stories. I have a story to share with you today. Will you be able to listen? It's the fall of 2015. My mother and I are at Turquoise Naturopathics. It's an old-fashioned organic health food store near her home in Markham, Ontario. The owner of the store, the kind and mild-mannered Jeff, sports long hair and warm eyes. He locks the front door gingerly and places a dilapidated sign in the window back in five minutes. He's leaning over my mom who is sitting on a wooden stool. His hands are on the back of her shoulders, rubbing them. Get it out, Faride, he says to her gently. Get it all out. Scream. Get all the toxins out, this will help release it. Aren't you mad that you have tongue cancer? My mom grips my hand tightly. She tries to scream, she can't. I plead with her, mom, please, I say, try, try. I can feel all the things she wanted to say. Her hands trembled in mine. She opened her mouth, but no sound came out. I think about all the stories of my ancestors buried in my mother's mouth, stories I will never hear again. And I asked myself as a journalist, tears coursing down my face, how to surface those stories and others, unearthing them from under their tongue. 
Stephen, this one's for you. Two decades earlier, I'm sitting in the cafeteria at the CBC's national headquarters in Toronto. I've just started my new job as an editorial assistant for The National. I've worked hard to get here and I'm anxiously trying to prove myself. I'm sitting with six other EAs, all of us accomplished young journalists, other big news organizations, reading macaroni and cheese. One of the EAs at the table says to me, swelling out of seeming nowhere, you don't belong here. You don't deserve this job. You don't deserve to be in this newsroom. What she's saying, not out loud, but what I hear, you're only here because you're Indian and Iranian. Your mixed race different makes you a superficial but ultimately valuable commodity. All you do is complain about the lack of coverage on Muslim people. I look around the table. Suddenly, everyone is staring at an empty horizon, searching for a spot across the room that only they can see, the refusal to make eye contact. I think of Shireen Razak's book, Looking White People in the Eye. I'm not sure what to say. I'm rendered mute, but she is not silent. She picks up her table night and points it in my face. She continues, Manel, you only got this job because you're not white, plain and simple. I say, PhD, I published in the star. I know I don't have your credentials, but she says again, you don't deserve to be here. James Baldwin tells us, you know, it's not the world that was my oppressor because what the world does to you, if the world does it to you long enough and effectively enough, you begin to do it to yourself. The question, you're what? The unspoken answer, never good enough. I begin to believe in myself, I am a failure. 20 years later, give or take, I've done all I can to overcome my fears of being successful. But between opportunities, my phone rings. My friend Kirk has recommended me as a host for a radio show interviewing guests. It's for a new station, a commercial one, just starting out. He's taking on the morning drive-in show. Do I want to try out for it? I think this is crazy. I'm an academic. Why would I even take this on? But I record an audition tape. I mean, why not? I email it to my mom with whom I check in about, you know, just about everything. She calls me immediately. What a wonderful job you've done, Junam, she says, accelerated, breathless. You sound so professional, mashallah. I say a small prayer, bismillah, hiraman, nirahim, and sit, send, and fire it off, and I get the job. But when I start, I realize I am not good at this. I don't know how to write a script, how to write out time codes, or even how to segue from guest to guest. But I know the show I want to write is anti-racist, anti-colonial. But I'm under no illusions of what I'm up against here. In the colonial order of things, anti-colonial stories are always threatening, of course. The question again, what do you mean by that? The answer is the very foundations of white storytelling. These stories don't always allow for a more multifaceted worldview. How can you begin to tell stories out of possible white telling? Manel, your position is subjective, not objective. You're not neutral, as if I ever would want to be. In designing the show, I become enthusiastic, but at the start, I know I sound stiff. I berate myself for my poor performance, and I call my mom, tell her I don't know what I'm doing. Junam, she says in her beautiful sing-song cadence, be patient with yourself. You're so hard on yourself. Patience. What does patience look for us as racialized bodies when one is asked to carry that excess freight of patience for years? Manel, be patient. Racism won't disappear overnight. I hear this refrain over and over. I bet you do too. After consulting with some trusted friends of color, I realize why I feel so alone. I'm swimming backwards. I can't be the sole quantum of wisdom sharing the stories of others unfettered, so I slowly gather a constellation of people around me, key columnists, including people like Henry Yu, who teaches at UBC in Asian studies, people like Zul Sulman, who is a well-respected Muslim lawyer in the community. I invite them to bring on a guest of their choice every week, and I realize I don't have to carry this freight alone. I'm not here to provide a voice for the voiceless. That is not my job. Arundhati Roy reminds us there is no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. The deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. So I try to ask myself some difficult questions before I start posing questions to others behind a mic. I ask each one how they want to be identified, what their preferred gender pronoun is, what has exasperated them about interviews in the past. I scour other interviews asking them how it is that they enjoy the experience or not. I make it a prayer to, to make sure that I bring on board indigenous people of color. This is one way to challenge Islamophobia and all different kinds of racism that we hear in mainstream media. 
The show starts to become successful, whatever that looks like. A community builder award, a photo spread in a flashy magazine. I start receiving handwritten letters from authors on thick manila paper, letters from people like Ann Patchett, even interviewing Salman Rushdie, Lawrence Hill, Colson Whitehead. The interviews are glorious and magical. We start getting fan mail, but who cares? I still feel panicky when I get into work. Nothing feels like enough. Our numbers are up. My boss tells me people are tuning in. Keep up the good work, I'm told, but I can't hear the praise. I'm unable to hear the praise. It is around this time that stage four tongue cancer is declared. I fly back to Toronto yet again and drive my mom to the Sunnybrook Cancer Medical Clinic. Maybe you know it, but I hope you don't. We see the oncologist and she can barely speak now. I pepper the doctor with questions using the techniques I've meticulously sharpened for months in front of the mic. I'm careful to enunciate clearly and to try not to duplicate questions. What is the prognosis? What is the surgery he recommends? How long will the recovery period be? What should she be eating? Will the insurer be enough for to provide her with enough nutrients to keep her alive? I keep on answering and asking questions and keep scribbling his answers in my notebook, but there is no answer that will explain this cancer way. No answer that will make me feel more settled, safe, able to breathe again. I fly back to Vancouver five hours away and feel the sting of leaving my mom behind. And when I get back to that radio studio, I clear my throat and try to pose the sacred and generous questions to my guests that deserve an answer. And through the pain of being in that studio so far away from my mom, my mom we can no longer speak. I recognize how speaking will never be enough. In between checking my texts constantly, hoping to hear from my mom, I often find myself unable to speak, tongue-tied, forlorn, and furiously flushed with my lack of fluency. What questions can I possibly ask? What questions that will open up the floodgates for my guest? Where they will questions that don't box the guest and who is generous enough to sit across from me. The coloniality of the interview I've scribbled in my notebook at the time, the questions already gestured to a pre-existing saturation point of privilege, power, answer, questions is cage. I remember the famous interview whisperer, John Sawatsky telling me at the CBC that the most important question we can ask in a TV interview or radio is what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? We ask the guests to repeat themselves over and over until we get the answer we want, until we get the perfect clip, until we hear what we want to hear. And for years, I have to tell you, I thought this was a brilliant question. Now, after doing interviews with Black, Indigenous people of color, I'm not so sure. What do you mean by that? The burden of extraction and possibly placed upon our interviewees, because, of course, they're seen as our interviews, interviewees, naturally, our property, with us forcing, dragging, pulling the information we so violently demand from them, wrenching it out from under their tongues like blood-stained molars from their mouths, that process of extraction at the heart of colonial practice. I wonder how we can escape this trap I'm inev inevitably caught in. By mid-January 2016, my mom could no longer talk mere months after her diagnosis. My brother and I, running out of options in Canada, take all our money that we have and struggle to find our alternative care in Frankfurt, Germany. I fly from Vancouver to Germany to be by her side. I pray on the floor of the airplane near the toilets. A Muslim family in first class sees me bending down and lends me their beige satin head covering to pray. Before I get off the plane, they give it for me to keep. The ride to the clinic felt long. When I arrive, it is all white, brisk and clean and my mother was lying in bed thinner than I've ever seen her. She can't talk anymore, but she smiles, luminescent. I spent hours with my mom at that clinic, watching her get vitamin IVs and hoping like hell the treatment would work. The last words I remember from the dazzling, handsome, and perfectly coiffed specialist after my mom had been there one month was, when she goes, it'll be quick. That was all the clinic offered us at the end. It gave us hope. But months later, she would be dead. What do I choose to remember from that time? What prayers can I say now? What prayers can I say now? I think about the sound of my mother's voice, the soft, lilting tones I took for granted all those years. I think about her last words to me, really held no sound, just her mouthing the words, wish come true, as she drew a heart with her fingers in the air. Wish come true, the coarse Arabic translation of my name. The poet Rumi says, there is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. I wonder if it is now time for me to open my mouth, to share these stories with you, to take the risk of ushering them into a space where they may be welcomed into a more hospitable arena. Can these truths finally exist somewhere other than outside of my body? Can your truths exist somewhere outside of yours? Thank you for listening.
thank you so much, Manel. That was uh, that was such an incredibly powerful, and truthful, and a beautiful story and dedication um, to your mother. Your writings really paint such a vivid picture and, and took us on a journey through that experience. And I really appreciated how you said, if, if the world does it to you long enough, you start to believe it yourself. And, and how you stress the importance of being patient with yourself. Um, because you're right, people of color and racialized groups are always seemingly have to, having to justify our own existence. Um, when Simply, we're just trying to live. So thank you so much. So we will uh, move along to our next uh, panelist. Uh, so I would like to now introduce you to Dr. Kenneth Fung. Dr. Fung is the staff psychiatrist and clinical director of the Asian Initiative Mental Health Program at the Toronto Western Hospital, University Health Network. He is the director of global mental health and the associate professor with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. His research, teachings, and clinical interests include both cultures, cultural psychiatry and psychotherapy, especially acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, C, CBT, and mindfulness. He conducts community-based research in stigma, resilience, mental health promotion, trauma, caregivers for children with ASD, immigrant and refugee mental health, and pandemic response. His awards include the 2015 Social Responsibility Award from the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine, the 2016 American Psych Psychiatric Association Foundation Award for Advancing Minority Health, the 2017 College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario Council Award, the 2018 Psychotherapy Award for Academic Excellence from the University of Toronto, and the 2020 Colin Wolf Award for Sustained Excellence in Teaching and the Canada 150 Medal. His presentation will discuss the impact of racism on mental health and the importance of promoting mental health resilience in concert with championing for equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So with that, welcome Dr. Fung. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me in the in the panel. I just want to also say that was such a moving sharing from Manel, and uh, touched by your sharing. So thank you for that. Um, so for um, this uh, presentation, I will touch on the issue of racism and also focus a bit on the mental health aspect as well. Um, you can see my slides, okay, right? <laughs> okay, so I, maybe I will begin with uh, some reflective uh, questions, and I don't, I don't think we can see the participants, otherwise I'll ask you to raise your hands, but maybe you can keep track of how many yes you would say to these questions. The first question is, have you experienced racism in your life? And have you witnessed racism and discrimination happening in front of your eyes? Maybe not to you, but to someone else. And have you spoken out against racism or discrimination? And number four is, have you experienced any racist or discriminating thoughts in your own mind under certain circumstances or particular contexts? So I would invite you to reflect on these questions as we discuss this issue of racism and uh, I, I don't know if we'll jam up the chat channel, but if you can, if uh, certain questions apply to you, like one, two, three, four, maybe you can just say one and three applies to you. You can put one and three. If everything applies to you, you can put one, two, three, four. And maybe um, through Feedloot, someone can give us an approximate whether most people had experienced one of these four questions. So with uh, racism, it's, of course, got a long history, I think there's more momentum uh, for us to talk more about it. And uh, of course, one of the uh, biggest movement is the Black Lives Matter movement after uh, George Floyd's death. And uh, again, it, of course, it's a long uh, history of, of slavery and uh, systemic racism that is now uh, maybe more reach consciousness of people who haven't been paying attention, even though it's been staring us in the face for so long. Um, and not, not long after um, that, uh, those massive protests, like Nature, for example, just as an example, published this uh, study looking at, uh, you know, uh, the use of a force involving a gun in different neighborhoods. Um, you can see it's much higher 
in neighborhoods where there are a lot of black residents, but you can see the difference also between white officers and black officers. So this is a, a, a very a sobering uh, a graphic to, to see it plotted like this in, in a scientific magazine. Uh, so it's not like certainly for the lack of knowledge of this or even scientific evidence that this is a huge and major problem and the suffering we're seeing. And of course, uh, the indigenous populations um, have experienced uh, racism and uh, cultural genocide and oppression in Canada and United States. Um, if we look at the indigenous schools, this photo um, of trying to uh, convert and uh, a boy away from his heritage. And you can, and of course, we are aware of the kind of abuse and extent of residential schools and the impact that echoes to this day through intergenerational trauma from a psychiatric perspective. And, uh, and more recently, um, of, of course, the issue of uh, unmarked graves that are thousands and thousands. And from the Asians, as Chinese, for instance, uh, the building of the railroad for the country um, has been marked with deaths of Chinese workers, probably for every mile track and uh, a Chinese worker has died and maybe much more uh, because uh, uh, they were assigned the most dangerous jobs. And after that systemically um, try to be excluded through legal acts dedicated for the Chinese, which is kind of rare, but the Chinese had tax um, followed only by the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was kind of only repealed when Canada has to join the UN and it was seen as a, a, a barrier. So it was kind of uh, unwillingly abandoned and the apology only came in 2006. Um, but of course with the pandemic, the national poll show 50% of, uh, of those surveyed of Chinese origin has been directly um, insulted uh, or threatened uh, because of COVID. Um, and from another voluntary reporting database, over a thousand cases of racist attacks, including 10% involving physical violence. Uh, since the pandemic, it's all related to COVID. And of course, a vast underestimate, these are just voluntary reporting to websites. Um, so we can see the extent. So in Chinese racism, um, the reason I also talk about the history, just like the other uh, populations, is that we don't talk enough about it because Chinese racism, um, Asian racism, has been really not part of consciousness, perhaps even in anti-racist movement. And a lot of scholars believe that this is because of the promotion of the myth of the model minority, that maybe this race has it better. Um, and this kind of uh, myth, we call it a myth because if you look at it, there's also inequities uh, in all parameters. Um, but this myth is actually only, uh, well, benefits none of the minority races because it, it, it becomes used as a tool to blame uh, races um, that, oh, if you only work hard enough, you can overcome or to downplay the extent of racism um, of various kinds in society. So it is uh, much more useful to look at racism in all its guises and all its forms um, against all the, all the minoritized and marginalized uh, communities. When we talk about discrimination and racism, we can look at it at different levels. Certainly there's the structural and systemic level where racism are baked into the system of structures and pervades all around us in terms of policies and how structures are set up. And in the meso level, in the very institutions, whether it's schools or the very hospital you walk in, there are, there are institutionalized policies there. And then of course, in an interpersonal level, when some of the things that we just talked about, where it's one-to-one, -one, 
or one to a group uh, in front of you. And then and from a psychological level, we talk about internalized, that is the marginalized groups start to um, internalize psychologically and agree with some of the points, whether it is believing that yes, they will be discriminated to, yes, there are some flaws in me, or my culture may not be as good. Maybe there is some a grain of truth to what people are saying, or maybe there's something fundamentally shameful about my skin color, about my religion, about my race, um, about my culture, all of that become internalized. Um, and it becomes disempowering. And, and, and there are different types of the acts of racism too. It can be overt, but many can be covert. And some can be called microaggressions. And from a psychological point of view, the damage can be just as bad because the, oftentimes those who experience microaggressions or covert racism are left with, am I just being too sensitive? Should I just roll with it? Should I just be the bigger person? Um, am I uh, uh, making too much of a noise? So it says not only do they experience the racism, but they feel disempowered to do something about it. They may even feel a, a, a source of shame and blame for even feeling distressed, which is why it's so corrosive in nature. And so the impact from a mental health point of view, it's so wide ranging. There's direct mental health impact, obviously. It is traumatizing. It can be emotionally distressing. And then there's this internalization of experience. But of course, it impacts on the social determinants of health and mental health in all four sorts of form from income to housing, uh, to policies, to access to services, all of this. There's this concept of allostatic load that over time is not just one individual stressor. So that if we look at the minoritized races, um, they often have higher high blood pressure, higher cardiac disease. It's the cumulative of all these insults, large and small, systemic and personal. And then we talk about intersectionality because it's not just often one strike against you, but it can be double and triple if due to the intersection of race, but also gender, but also uh, religion um, and sexuality and sexual orientation um, and social class. Each layer um, can double, triple, quadruple the negative impact. We can see the impact on mental health even through the legal justice system where, um, well, the, the residential school is one example, but for many minoritized races, um, they are overrepresented in the mental health, uh, um, in the criminal justice system, um, and their mental health needs are under, um, uh, are not paid, to, uh, um, and uh, they have a harder time of getting mental health diversion, for ex for instance, um, and uh, child and protective services can be also a huge issue. They have barriers accessing social services and mental health services. It's just not there in terms of accessibility, oftentimes for language groups or culture, accessing to people who understand you uh, in a cultural way and the quality of services are compromised. It often leads to, from a systemic level, underfunding in mental health services for the marginalized uh, or cultural competent services um, in, in, in clinical care and in research. So what can we do? Um, certainly, I think being aware and acknowledge and able to have a sort of acceptance. When we say acceptance, we don't mean accepting the state of his fear. Acceptance as opposed to denial. Because sometimes in the face of racism is that it's hard to accept that these are happening. That because we have a certain self-image, especially in Canada, of being a polite or better off society. Although when we talk to a lot of people, that might not even be the case compared to US, for example. So to be able to come out from the avoidance to a sort of acceptance that there are issues that we need to deal with is perhaps the first step. And we need to listen and give voices to those who have these lived experience and take action in the micro, meso, and macro level.
So for example, the anti-Asian racism, we've had a national forum actually hosted by the UBC recently, and this is the link. And as a report and all the different sectors, so just highlighting the health sectors, some of the issues that we need to correct if we are to combat racism in healthcare. Because what we would want to do is to build up a model of resilience. Even though we are talking about um, trauma and we talk about intergenerational trauma from a mental health point of view, it's important to talk about resilience. When we use the word resilience, it doesn't mean that if you are distressed, you're not resilient. It is actually recognizing that resilience comes from both internal. In other words, we can do psychological intervention to build resilience, but external, we can build external resilience through social interventions and changing the meso macro structure. So I think that is the take home point to realize is we need to work in a health model of building resilience, but not only internally, but at a, glo at a global internal external level, integrated level. I'll just give you one example of a project that we're working on, uh, which is a, a six week online intervention which we're inviting to all healthcare providers actually to join. Through this six week intervention, we use an acceptance and commitment to empowerment model, which is an act-based acceptance and commitment therapy enhanced model of social justice to look at building this psychological flexibility and resilience so that we are able to achieve both individual, not only psychological mental well-being, but collectively because it's hard to just build individual psychological without looking at broader social justice issues. So this is just uh, some of our results of, the, of our first pilot groups that people do get better, including healthcare providers who join and they build their, their health and that they are able to see that when we're promoting our mental health well-being, it's actually not separate from increasing our conscious awareness of social justice issue and being empowered to do something about it, including racism. Um, so I think that's the tickle message too, which is sometimes we treat these issues as separate. So when you need mental health well-being, go see the psychiatrist for that, but we also need social justice and fight racism. But really I'm trying to say that those two are really linked and you cannot have one without the other. Even in a program like this, where we say, oh, we have pandemic, go mindfully meditate. And so you can calm down. But we're saying that's not enough. That it also includes looking at some of the social justice issue and get training on how do we move to towards the next step and get both together in an integrative way. So I invite you all health care providers, if you can help us recruit healthcare providers with had about 100 so far, but we have much more capacity. So please email us if you are interested in helping us promote this to all health care providers to both build psychological health, but also help people to feel like they are trained and empowered to do something about it in a social justice level. So with that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fung. I uh, really appreciated how you took us, first of all, on a bit of a historical journey of systemic racism in Canada and really unpack the myth of racism. Uh, racism is not just someone on the street telling me to go back to my country, but rather, as you very uh, clearly pointed out, there's an institutional structures that either discriminate by design or don't take into account the realities for people of color. When we look at immigrants and refugees arriving to our country, I think we can all agree one of the quickest ways for them to disconnect from the system is by feeling like they don't belong. And as someone who grew up in Canada, I just wanna hammer home your point of representation matters. It really, really does. It's impossible to feel like you belong without seeing that representation exemplified in front of you. So thank you so much, Dr. Fung. Um, so I would now like to welcome our next panelist, uh, Bushra Menai. Bushra has been a commissioner for the fight against racism and systemic discrimination since January, 2021. At the city of Montreal, her mandate is to ensure the transition towards inclusion within the municipal administration, holder of a doctorate in urban studies from the INRS-UCS, a master's degree in immigration and inter-ethnic relations, and a master's degree in geography. She works in university and community circles on issues of social exclusion, racism, and cohabitation in urban spaces. Author of 
Lea Mahrabin is the Montreal at Editions Pum. She's the author of several books, chapters, and articles which mobilize concepts surrounding racism, inclusion, and social exclusion. She's an affiliated researcher with LABRII. As a professional, she headed the Montreal Nord organization that promotes citizen mobilization aimed at social and territorial transformation. Welcome, Bushra. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for the uh, introduction. <clears throat> Thanks to uh, my colleagues. Um, I always uh, uh, introduce in English, but it's just a way to say that I will speak in French and I will be your uh, French immersion uh, for today. Um, donc, je voudrais remercier uh, toutes les organisatrices et tous les organisateurs de, de cet événement. Um, c'est vraiment un, un, un plaisir et un honneur pour moi de ramener des, des enjeux qui sont euh, extrêmement liés, qui me semblent euh, souvent déliés euh, dans un contexte canadien, québécois notamment, euh, la question du racisme systémique et euh, de l'islamophobie. Euh, je vous parle aujourd'hui de Montréal, euh, aussi euh, nommé Diodjagé, historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est une population qui est euh, très diversifiée, euh, notamment composée euh, d'Autochtones et d'autres peuples euh, qui y résident. Euh, Aujourd'hui, je, je vous parle de, comme commissaire à la, à la ville de, de Montréal et je vais revenir d'abord sur euh, l'initiative en fait, qui a été euh, menée par euh, la ville de Montréal euh, autour du bureau de la lutte contre le racisme et les discriminations systémiques. Et je vais revenir sur la, la, la mobilisation citoyenne qui a mené à une institutionnalisation de la réponse sur les enjeux euh, de racisme. D'abord, pourquoi c'est important de parler de racisme dans une ville euh, Minel euh, va beaucoup euh, euh, sourire probablement, mais pour moi, il est très important que ville métropole et enjeux de racisme soient reliés parce que ce sont les espaces où se vivent toutes les interactions sociales et la cohabitation entre les citoyens, notamment les citoyens qui sont très, très diversifiés. On le sait, historiquement, les villes sont l'espace de la diversité. L'école de Chicago en parle depuis plus d'un siècle. Et donc, aujourd'hui, nous sommes au Canada avec… En fait, nous avons des métropoles qui sont extrêmement diversifiées dans des provinces qui, elles, parfois le sont un petit peu moins, et c'est ce qui se passe souvent au Québec. Donc, pour moi, ce qui est important, c'est de relier la ville comme institution, comme administration, mais aussi comme lieu dans lequel peuvent se passer toutes les interactions haineuses, islamophobes et qui sont empreintes de racisme. Parce que ce sont dans nos rues, dans nos écoles, dans nos parcs, dans les, devant les commerces, euh, que peuvent se vivre justement ce qu'on appelle des agressions ou euh, des euh, crimes et des incidents haineux. Alors, c'est important de mentionner qu'à Montréal, donc à la ville de Montréal, nous avons reconnu il y a quelques mois la question du racisme systémique et l'ensemble des formes de racisme et de discrimination haineuse. La ville de Montréal, depuis janvier 2021, a créé le Bureau de la lutte contre le racisme et les discriminations systémiques que j'ai l'honneur de diriger en étant la commissaire. Et nous avons, par exemple, euh, euh, transformé la charte montréalaise des droits pour y inclure les discriminations systémiques et notamment inclure une perspective intersectionnelle sur la question euh, des discriminations. Ce qui est important de mentionner, c'est qu'il euh, ne suffit pas qu'une institution reconnaisse euh, la discrimination ou le racisme systémique pour que la culture et les pratiques organisationnelles se transforment. Ça, c'est la première, première des éléments. Deuxième élément, c'est que sans une mobilisation citoyenne qui porte la transformation collective, eh bien, il est très, très difficile que les institutions se transforment. Donc, j'ai la chance que la, la mobilisation citoyenne qui a duré un an et demi, quasiment deux ans à Montréal, a mené à 38 recommandations, dont le bureau que je dirige a le devoir d'implémenter de, de, et d'incarner, en fait, de faire incarner par l'administration municipale. Depuis plus de quatre ans, la ville de Montréal reconnaît la question de l'islamophobie, euh, notamment parce que vous, le, vous vous en rappelez tous, euh, au Québec, à Sainte-Foy, euh, nous avons euh, vu euh, cet attentat éroder euh, la question du vivre ensemble en, 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 à travers en fait, cette tragédie qui a 
coûté euh, la vie de six citoyens québécois musulmans qui ont été touchés dans l'enceinte même de leur lieu de culte. Et donc la ville de Montréal, depuis cet événement, reconnaît et tente de sensibiliser les, les citoyens et l'administration municipale sur ces questions-là et collabore avec l'écosystème des organisations musulmanes euh, euh, autour notamment de la semaine de sensibilisation musulmane qui a lieu euh, en janvier. Avec mon équipe, on travaille beaucoup sur euh, les enjeux du quotidien euh, en termes d'islamophobie, notamment en accompagnant les institutions de sécurité publique. Euh, Monsieur Fang le disait tantôt, il y a euh, toute une institutionnalisation de, de la discrimination euh, et de la non-réponse face à certaines problématiques. Et euh, nous avons, euh, comme ville et toutes les municipalités, ont la prérogative de la sécurité publique. Euh, et donc, comme bureau, nous travaillons et nous accompagnons toutes les unités de la ville de Montréal, donc le service de police, le service de l'inclusion, le service de la culture, le service de la mobilité, etc. etc. Et donc, avec le service de police notamment, euh, il est important que les incidents et les crimes haineux qui sont euh, euh, à caractère islamophobe autant qu'à caractère euh, antisémite ou notamment euh, qui vise les communautés noires ou qui vise les, les, les communautés, enfin euh, le, le, ce qu'on appelle le racisme anti-asiatique, il est important en fait d'avoir une réponse structurée et structurante sur les questions de racisme systémique, mais comme exactement vient de le mentionner euh, M. Fang, il est important aussi d'avoir des réponses qui soient dirigé euh, vers certaines communautés pour ne pas être dans, euh, dans un, une sorte d'universalisme du, de, du racisme systémique, mais au contraire d'avoir des réponses très euh, cadrées. Euh, je pense qu'il est important aussi de mentionner que sur les enjeux de racisme systémique et de discrimination systémique, si on n'a pas aussi une réponse euh, avec le euh, « race, classe, genre », si je peux me permettre, euh, et, et si on n'a pas des réponses en termes d'inclusion économique, eh bien, on ne peut pas assurer une équité territoriale parce que les communautés musulmanes du Québec sont très, très différentes ou peuvent être très différentes des communautés musulmanes du reste du Canada. Euh, en effet, euh, il y a une communauté maghrébine, donc d'Afrique du Nord, euh, qui, est, enfin, qui forme une, une, une grande partie de, de la vague des musulmans francophones euh, à Montréal et au Québec. Et euh, ce sont, disons que certaines des conditions socio-économiques dans lesquelles ils se trouvent fait que nous devons aussi avoir, si on veut, euh, lutter contre l'islamophobie. Il faut aussi qu'on s'assure d'avoir une, une lunette plus élargie sur les conditions économiques et socio-économiques et des territoires dans lesquels ces personnes euh, habitent. Donc, c'est pour ça que le bureau accompagne aussi nos collègues euh, du service de la diversité et de l'inclusion sociale, notamment le BINAM, qui a pour objectif d'accueillir les réfugiés et les nouveaux euh, Montréalais, je pense par exemple euh, aux réfugiés euh, qui viennent d'Afghanistan, eh c'est important qu'on qu assure une, une capacité d'accueil très, très rapidement, mais que l'on s'assure que cette capacité d'accueil s'allie aussi avec une vision qui est non discriminatoire, non islamophobe, non, euh, enfin, qui soit antiraciste et qui, pas, donc, euh, qui ne verse pas dans certaines euh, perspectives euh, anti, euh, racistes. Euh, sur les enjeux d'islamophobie particulièrement, la question que j'aimerais qu'on se pose et que je vous pose où que vous soyez aujourd'hui au Canada, c'est de se dire, OK, quels sont les éléments à partir desquels institutionnellement et euh, structurellement on peut euh, travailler De mon point de vue, je vois plusieurs éléments. Euh, la question de l'enjeu de la haine en ligne a été quelque chose de très discuté dans les derniers mois, qui n'a pas euh, été, euh, on va dire, jusqu'au bout en termes d'implémentation de, de, politique, euh, mais nous voyons beaucoup de difficultés à l'intérieur même des administrations, notamment quand il s'agit de répondre du point de vue de la sécurité publique, euh, parce que la haine en ligne euh, n'est pas euh, gérée de façon à ce que les, les plateformes sur lesquelles les propos haineux, les propos islamophobes euh, qui se tiennent soient euh, gérés par les plateformes elles-mêmes. Donc, on a un enjeu d'espace virtuel à travers lequel peut se reproduire tout un discours islamophobe et euh, raciste. Euh, le deuxième enjeu que je souhaite mentionner, c'est l'enjeu du soutien aux organisations qui accueillent les victimes. Monsieur Fang a, a fait une, une très belle euh, démonstration du fait que le racisme et la discrimination ont des effets directs et indirects sur la santé physique et mentale des personnes racisées. Et lorsque l'on comprend cela, 
il faut que l'on s'assure que les espaces d'accueil des victimes soient eux-mêmes des espaces qui soient « safe »,« secure », tout comme on est capable de le penser aujourd'hui pour les femmes. Euh, les effets de la haine en ligne et de la haine dans les, dans les espaces publics, des micro-agressions, des incidents et des crimes haineux ont un effet direct sur la santé mentale. Et je pense notamment aux femmes racisées musulmanes euh, et aux femmes musulmanes qui visibilisent leur euh, appartenance religieuse, par exemple en portant le voile, et qui deviennent des cibles très, très directes dans l'espace public de, euh, de personnes euh, qui, en fait, qui ont une, une charge raciste euh, et qui peuvent euh, en fait, invectiver ce genre euh, de personnes. Le troisième élément que je vois, c'est la façon avec laquelle nous devrions penser des partenariats stratégiques entre métropoles du Canada euh, où des communautés justement euh, musulmanes, euh, anglophones ont peut-être déjà établi certaines, euh, certains, un certain rapport avec certaines institutions ou certaines villes et euh, notamment les communautés francophones euh, du Québec et notamment de, de, de Montréal. Je crois que c'est très important euh, de, de penser ces partenariats stratégiques-là parce que nous devons nous assurer d'avoir une culture de la on va dire du partage d'expériences d'une part et euh, une culture de la data, une culture de la donnée qui nous permettent de, de mieux comprendre quelles sont les situations qui sont vécues de façon différente selon les provinces, selon les villes et qui nous permettent, nous comme administration, nous comme institution, de répondre à ce que M. Fong encore amenait tout à l'heure, c'est-à-dire l'inéquité qui est structurelle, l'inéquité qui est systémique et l'inéquité qui est en fait portée euh, malgré soi, par les institutions. Euh, je pense qu'il y a une reconnaissance nécessaire de la question de l'islamophobie euh, et qui doit passer par des programmes euh, spécifiques, autant, comme je le disais, qu'une euh, lecture beaucoup plus en termes de racisme euh, systémique. Euh, un élément que je pense important en termes euh, de, de réponse institutionnelle, c'est toute la question de l'augmentation de la haine et des crimes haineux qui, en fait, doit être analysé aussi à travers le prisme d'une meilleure compréhension de ce que sont les incidents et les crimes haineux et donc d'un meilleur, meilleur report. S'il si y a une augmentation, c'est parce qu'il y a une augmentation des actes, mais s'il y a une augmentation, c'est aussi parce qu'il y a une augmentation des plaintes. Et donc, la façon avec laquelle nous devons penser l'accueil des plaintes, la gestion des plaintes, et c'est exactement ce que tu mentionnais, Ahmad, c'est comment on s'assure comme institution et comme euh, administration d'être en mesure de recevoir ce que l'on n'était pas habitué à recevoir, ce que nous n'étions pas euh, formés à, à, à recevoir. Et donc, il y a une, une, une hausse euh, des incidents et des crimineux à travers le pays, et nous l'avons vu à Montréal, et London, euh, cette année, a encore été un exemple euh, tout à fait euh, tragique de, 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 de la question de l'islamophobie qui est réelle et qui tue. Euh, et, et, et ces tragédies-là s'accompagnent de tragédies quotidiennes que vivent de nombreux citoyens et citoyennes musulmanes euh, et musulmans du Québec et euh, du, du, du Canada. Et donc, l'augmentation des plaintes, pour moi, traduit une non-acceptabilité sociale de la haine dans les espaces publics. Et euh, ce que nous avons comme institution et comme administration, par exemple, à travailler, c'est une meilleure conscientisation conscientisation euh, de toutes et tous et de dire que la conscientisation, pardon, la conscientisation est une priorité aussi à travers euh, les, les administrations et euh, les institutions. Euh, au Québec, vous le savez, nous sommes dans un contexte où il, il y a une loi euh, qui s'appelle la loi 21. Donc, la loi 21 fait partie du contexte dans lequel nous devons opérer euh, euh, au, au, au Québec et nous avons euh, tout un... Euh, tout un outillage euh, en termes de droit et euh, euh, en termes de droit, notamment avec ce qui est fait par la commission des droits de la personne et euh, de la jeunesse, et qui est un, un des, une des plateformes à travers lesquelles nous pouvons travailler sur ces enjeux-là. Euh, je souhaite rementionner l'importance de la l'emphase sur l'importance de la, la culture de la data. Euh, comme chercheur. Euh, je crois que nous avons le devoir comme administration et comme institution de documenter le vécu des personnes racisées. Euh, et les personnes qui vivent de l'islamophobie, euh, nous devons documenter leur réalité. Euh, 
nous avons aussi un devoir, je pense, de penser l'impact de nos financements euh, euh, dans les programmes qui visent à lutter contre le, le racisme et les discriminations systémiques. Et je pense que ce qui est important, c'est de mentionner dans quelle mesure les, les financements que nous octroyons, que ce soit au niveau municipal ou au niveau fédéral ou au niveau provincial, comment on s'assure que ces financements-là ont un impact sur les personnes concernées. Monsieur Fang le, le mentionnait tantôt aussi, souvent les personnes concernées sont, euh, sont, euh, sont retirés de la réflexion même de la production des programmes et des financements publics. Et tout mon travail consiste à remettre les personnes racisées et les personnes qui vivent le racisme au cœur même de la réflexion et de la production. Euh, Peut-être dans le fond, pour euh, terminer, ce qui m'importe beaucoup, c'est de, de, de voir comment nous devons, comme, par exemple moi comme bureau, mais dans l'ensemble de nos villes au pays, comment on s'assure d'accompagner nos institutions, toutes nos institutions, y compris les institutions de sécurité publique. Je crois personnellement que c'est en s'assurant que la haine et l'islamophobie, l'antisémitisme, le racisme anti-asiatique, euh, le racisme anti-noir, toutes les formes de racisme. Je, 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 dans le fond, ce que, ce que je pense, c'est que c'est en assurant à des institutions une meilleure compréhension de ces questions-là. C'est en assurant à nos employés des administrations publiques une meilleure compréhension de ces questions-là. C'est en assurant aux employés des, 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 ce qu'on appelle les services de, de protection de la jeunesse ou les, les services sociaux, euh, les, services, euh, les milieux euh, médicaux, les milieux scolaires. C'est-à-dire comment nos institutions elles-mêmes doivent revoir leur propre compréhension vis-à-vis -vis de ces euh, enjeux de haine euh, et d'islamophobie de, de, et de racisme pour que l'on s'assure d'avoir des réponses qui soient idoines et qui soient euh, des, des bonnes réponses sur ces enjeux-là. Euh, Peut-être en, en guise de conclusion, pour moi, il est très important comme métropole de saisir la responsabilité, euh, notre responsabilité collective vis-à-vis -vis de la question de la discrimination raciale qui est historique. Euh, euh, nous avons, par exemple, euh, nous allons déployer à Montréal une une, une, un programme, enfin, comme un plan euh, sur le racisme anti-asiatique, et ça va être le premier. Euh, et euh, pour moi, il est très important de considérer que ce n'est pas la COVID qui a révélé, ou peut-être que pour certains, la COVID a révélé le racisme anti-asiatique, mais c'est une, une inéquité et une discrimination raciale qui est ancrée dans l'histoire de notre pays. Et donc, pour moi, il, il importe que l'on relie toujours l'actualité qui nous, a, nous amène à, 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 à travailler et à répondre à toute une historicité du racisme et de la discrimination raciale. Donc pour moi, si on regarde les événements islamophobes qui ont eu lieu cette année, il est important de les ramener dans l'ensemble de la vingtaine d'années et des dix, décennies précédentes, la vingtaine d'années depuis le 11 septembre, où on voit les effets au quotidien sur les musulmans et comme Minel l'a si bien euh, poétiquement euh, illustré tout à l'heure, ce quotidien qui est fait de discrimination et d'islamophobie. Mais il faut aussi que l'on regarde les avancées en matière de discrimination et de, de lutte au racisme d'une manière générale. Et donc, je crois qu'il faut avoir toujours cette vision équilibrée entre qu'est-ce qu'il nous faut encore parcourir, mais quel est aussi le chemin que nous avons tenté euh, de parcourir. Peut-être le dernier mot que j'ai envie de mentionner, c'est que nous devons à chaque fois répondre de façon spécifique aux enjeux d'islamophobie euh, qui visent et le racisme anti-musulman, mais nous devons avoir une lecture nécessairement euh, qui, qui crée des, on va dire des, des connexions entre les diverses communautés racisées, parce que ce que fait le racisme, c'est qu'il divise. Donc la meilleure réponse au racisme, c'est de se structurer et de s'émanciper, entre guillemets, de cette division qui est, euh, qui, qui est en fait vécue par les personnes elles-mêmes. Merci pour votre écoute. Merci, Bouchra. Thank you so much for sharing and, and really your role and the crucial work you do for the city of Montreal. Uh, I thought it was so really important how you highlighted um, the importance for institutions to recognize inequities and, and inequalities and how that responsibility uh, has to go on the organization themselves to revamp, revamp and reinvent themselves um, and position themselves um, as actual drivers of change. As advocates for social justice, implementing change can only occur when institutions are willing to acknowledge their own shortcomings and commit themselves to that positive change, that positive growth. Uh, I also really appreciated how you highlighted the importance of recognizing uh, the difference between different Muslim groups. There is no one size fits all when it comes to being Muslim, and we definitely experience varying degrees um, and discrimination uh, for Islamophobia. So thank you again, Bashar. 
Uh, so I would now like to welcome our final panelist for this session, uh, Stephen Zhao. Stephen is an investigative journalist who focuses on national security and discrimination issues. He has worked as a journalist, producer, and scriptwriter for the CBC and the Ottawa Citizen. He is an affiliate of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, and you can read his work in the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, and the Walrus Magazine, Foreign Policy, and the LA Review of Books, among other outlets. You can follow him on Twitter at, at Stephen Space Zhao. This presentation today is titled, Canada's Islamophobia Problem, What Can Be Done? And he will discuss the findings and lessons derived from his reporting the past six years on far-right nativism globally and the fear of the loss of traditional values that antagonize immigrants, refugees, Jews, Muslims, etc. Welcome, Stephen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Stephen. I'm speaking to you today uh, from Toronto, Ontario. I hope my internet Wi-Fi holds up for all of you guys and you can all hear me. Let me know if that's not the case. Um, I am speaking to you from my place, um, area in Toronto, which is technically Treaty 13 territory with the uh, Mississauga of the new, uh, new credit. And uh, at one point was also the, um, the land of the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and uh, other nations. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you so much for the panelists. And I think I've taken stock of what you've said and I hope um, my presentation can add something that's complimentary to the discussion today. Um, as mentioned, the uh, work I've been doing perhaps for the past five or six years has revolved around, I think, what can be called discrimination issues perhaps. And um, unfortunately with um, Islamophobia, for instance, as the uh, center of, uh, or, or a central piece of that uh, swath of issues, which um, I've been trying to look at and report on for the past, say, five years or so. And I wanna discuss some of the findings with you, um, not just my stories, but how that fits uh, within the larger scheme of things uh, nationally, but you know, at what we're experiencing as, as, as a country in terms of um, not just with COVID-19 in recent years, but the rise in hate crimes and so on, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, but also some lessons that I, you know, personally, I think, you know, just to, trying to be a thinking journalist here and trying to interpret what I see. Um, I want to share some of that with you as well. And I think what will end up, uh, what you'll end up seeing is that I have a problem given what I have uh, reported on with um, our self description as Canadians, uh, that we live in a relatively socially harmonious multicultural liberal democracy. Uh, these are big questions and let's get into it. Okay, so if you take a step back, um, we might say that we live in somewhat cataclysmic, politically catacly cataclysmic times. And um, what we are having perhaps is uh, are all around the world, people are disenchanted by different kinds of effects of globalization. Um, we used to categorize ourselves with the uh, left-leaning, right-leaning kind of political spectrum. I think we're seeing somewhat of disintegration of that even, not to get too theoretical, but these days it seems like everybody falls on part of some spectrum with regards to how they feel about um, the movement of people, the movement of labor, movement of capital, et cetera, et cetera. These large pillars of what we call globalization, not just since the 90s or 80s with like NAFTA and stuff like that, but I would say it's two, 300 years of this kind of thing happening. And it's been disrupting human life for, for some time. And uh, one reaction to it within say the past 10 years, uh, or even you could say the past six, seven years, um, if you start in 2014 with the election of the, uh, uh, the Hindutva Nationalist Party in India with uh, Narendra Modi, you could say that from India, from 2016 with Donald Trump, Trump and et cetera, et cetera, uh, Bolsonaro and Brazil and so on and so forth, 
uh, th these are somewhat nativist reactions to the uh, corrupt pe what people perceive perhaps as the corruption of um, liberal centrism and uh, the capitalist uh, structures that uphold try to uphold it and the inequality that result from it and so on and so forth. Um, I, I just that's just all by way of saying that I think as Canadians we sort of see our we have been portrayed um, by others and by ourselves, perhaps at the uh, higher echelons, uh, as a, a kind of exception to that wave of populist um, uh, re reactions, I guess, or uh, revanchism uh, that often take on very nativist, racist tones around the world. It is not a purely a Western European white kind of thing um, that, of course, uh, is anti-refugee anti-Muslim, anti Islamophobic, racist, often anti-Black and so on and so forth, but is has spread across the world and in places like in Asia, for instance, which you can say is kind of the, an avant-garde of uh, neo-fascism these days. I hope that's not too hyperbolic. Well, as a result, you can, this is, uh, I don't think I'm saying anything new here. The uh, attacks are up. The By attacks, I mean the uh, racist kind of uh, incidents are up here in Canada. Um, and I bring this up to say, look, the uh, kind of overarching discourse, if you look at some of the international publications, which I'll get into, is that Canada, by and large, because we elect the Liberals um, and we have, you know, the NDP or whatever, that our national discourse is generally escaped the... Uh, disenchantment with, with uh, liberal centrist institutions like the UN and now with the WHO with COVID and stuff like that. And we've, we've kind of been um, able to, to uh, hold down the fort of the new, the new order of the world um, that's been built up by free trade, free movement, free labor, um, unregulated capitalism, and uh, which has given rise to uh, massive amounts of inequality domestically and abroad. But that's only if you look at, I mean, that's only the case if you look at who we elect and why should our country, why should we look at our country just by that one barometer? Because of COVID, um, because of COVID and because of other things, but mainly because of this pandemic, for, for example, has kind of, um, I say it has, it has much more obvious. Um, you can look up uh, Bloomberg magazine, I think, did a very large piece about it. Supposedly the most Asian, quote unquote, Asian place in the world. I don't like that term often. Asian, I think it's very inexact. Um, experiencing like eightfold rise in, quote unquote, anti Asian hate crimes. Uh, inequality, you can literally map out, uh, you take a map of, uh, Toronto, some of the um, socioeconomically disadvantaged, underserved places have the higher amount of uh, COVID infections and so on and so forth. These are, again, I'm just bring, bringing this up as background information for you to think about. So all of that is to say, when you look beneath the surface, when you just stop, you know, judging, I think internationally, perhaps people like to do this. Um, if we stop judging the... Uh, where a country is going or what a country is like primarily by who the people elect, you know, once every four or five years or whatever the case may be, then you'll see that beneath the, um, beneath the surface, things are, are moving and shifting as well. And one way that is, uh, one way that Canada is not an exception to this kind of populist, racialist revanchism uh, sweeping its way across the world within the past five years uh, maybe continuing to do so, is that, yes, we are experiencing sort of like white supremacist-centered um, racial revanchism and populism in the form of, you could say, some people would say the People's Party of Canada or the uh, populist shift within the, uh, the some of the rhetoric um, in the past few years uh, within the Conservative Party, maybe, maybe less so now with Aaron O'Toole. Um, 
there is that and you see yes there is the kind of like white supremacist uh killings of the uh, uh white supremacist anti-refugee killings of the mosque goers in quebec city in 2017 it's absolute um uh, i feel like that you know these things go in and out of the the news cycle and we forget you know and just last summer of course there was the the truck attack in Ontario, uh, London, Ontario, which killed an entire family of Muslims on, on their way, uh, just walking in their neighborhood. That is all part of what I'm, what I'm talking about, but it's even worse than that, isn't it? Because, because of this internalized white supremacy that I think um, uh, was talked about uh, by a previous panelist in the a previous presentation, the a lot of minorities also internalized different racial hierarchies within themselves. And that is not just purely a psychological internal process. It's also played out in sociopolitical ways, even in elections, and even by people who are supposedly representative of their constituencies and, and participate in electoral politics. For instance, in a few years ago, this is an article from three years ago, uh, leading up a few months into the 2019, uh, about a year or so into the 2019 federal election, uh, there were a lot of organizers in around the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area, who were um, essentially uh, going around saying that predominantly Chinese Canadian newcomer areas are being threatened by new asylum seekers who are predominantly Black. And a big, this prompted, this kind of triggered a big rally in the uh, municipality of Markham, which is just north of downtown Toronto, um, an anti-refugee, anti-illegal free rider, anti-illegal uh, immigrant sort of um, demonstration by uh, like over a hundred people from the Chinese, commu Chinese Canadian community in that area. And it was very jarring. And it was because people were told that their communities were being threatened by this. And this is, again, can, Canadian neighborhoods, uh, organizers or whoever these people are kind of playing into this predominantly international or national um, far right talking point of different peaceful neighborhoods being threatened by the other. Here's another example, just to say that it's not purely, you know, um, that it, this is affecting everyone, okay, is that there, if you are, for example, a, um, someone who works within a Canadian university and is, studies uh, uh, issues coming out of India, and you don't have great things to say about, for example, the, the government there in New Delhi, the BJP, um, there has been a huge increase in the kind of online threats and stuff like that. Online threats, physical threats, uh, hate speech, Islamophobia, and so on, that you, that you get targeted by. Not just online, but also there are demonstrations and, and so forth. And this is all my way of saying, because we are living in this place of uh, not just people moving around a lot, but also communications are, are very open because of social media and texting, WhatsApp, WeChat, and so on and so forth. All these platforms facilitate the ability of certain actors around the world who, are, who have a more nativist slant in order to organize diaspora communities along certain, along certain lines and in ways that um, I think are, can often be characterized as hateful. And primarily, I think, unfortunately, the through line is Islamophobia. That's kind of a bread and butter way of um, creating a kind of constituency. I'll try to blast through these last ones. I know I'm taking a long time. I'm sorry. Um, what, what can I say? Like, because if, we, if, we, if you just look beneath the surface, I think it's very easy. It doesn't take even a minute for you to realize that this self-congratulation, uh, okay, uh, you know, granted this article from the um, the Economist uh, was from like five years ago, but I feel like this attitude still sticks around by by most of us who believe that diversity is enough, 
that just because you have people uh, neighborhood neighbors who look different from you uh, than just the fact that you guys are like living next to each other and you know you know maybe you get together and see each other once in a while everyone every once in a while for a concert or something that means social harmony uh, I I personally have very little, little patience for that these days because are we not all kind of um, affected by the um, by the kind of individualism of today, right? We we all are divided from the next person, but we also just happen to be living in a space where there are more different kinds of people thrown into one polity than ever before in the history of humanity. I don't think our leaders take that seriously enough because they only want votes. Um, they only go to certain communities for the first time, like a week or two before an election day, and they have no credibility often or not enough, and there's no trust building. And I'll conclude by saying um, just, I, I, th I think that obviously, yes, uh, racism, systemic racism needs, needs to be addressed at the legislative level. There needs to be a structure in place um, in order to limit the effects of different kinds of uh, racism, but there's not enough um, leadership in terms of trust building between people. And that's kind of a, a bias I've had perhaps as it just as a conclusion that different people aren't of, diff of different backgrounds aren't necessarily given a space where they can represent uh, their backgrounds to others. And uh, um, if our political structure is not necessarily geared to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, you really did an amazing job of unpacking uh, the rise of right-wing populism, specifically how this global movement uh, is growing here in Canada. It's very important to recognize as a society what we're up against and, and for sure how politicians uh, play a role right now and will continue playing a role. I appreciated how you highlighted that Canada is not immune. There's sometimes this idea that Canada is all roses and daisies when it comes to discrimination and inequalities. And anyone with their eyes even kind of open knows this to not be true. And once again, we have to dismantle that idea in order to make the progress that we need to make, um, acknowledge the structures that we are up against. So. Thanks again, Stephen, and really a big thank you to all our panelists. Um, I know we are getting a little bit tight on time, but I'm hoping uh, we can just touch on at least a couple questions here. So if you have any questions to any of the participants, uh, you can submit those through the right-hand column on feed loop. And I see that we do, uh, we do have one question right here. So a question uh, for Bushra, and this was actually asked in French, but I'll just read the translation as my French language skills aren't there, unfortunately. Um, so the question is, are you suggesting that we voice more or less racism in urban communities? Do we have any relationship of difference between urban and rural communities? That's a very interesting question. Uh, so I'll go in French. Um, si, si je considère uh, seulement la question de l'islamophobie, je vais essayer de répondre à travers la, la question de l'islamophobie. Euh, depuis euh, à peu près 4-5 ans, euh, il y a eu euh, plusieurs recherches qui ont tenté de documenter la question des incidents et des crimes haineux au Québec. Euh, la Commission des droits de la personne et de la jeunesse donc, euh, euh, du Québec a réalisé une étude euh, qui est sortie, je pense, il y a un an, un an, euh, un an et demi, et qui faisait état euh, à travers le Québec, donc incluant d'autres villes, donc il y a Montréal, d'autres villes comme Sherbrooke, comme Québec euh, et d'autres petites villes de, 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 la, de, la, de la province, euh, elle faisait état justement de ce qui était vécu euh, localement par les communautés euh, musulmanes et par les groupes euh, appartenant et les, les citoyens appartenant aux communautés musulmanes. Et il y avait effectivement... Une, on va dire une proportion assez importante euh, d'organisations qui relayaient une islamophobie très très latente, euh, des institutions qui ne le reconnaissaient pas, euh, des milieux scolaires par exemple où euh, il pouvait se passer euh, des, des événements. Euh, donc, je ne pense pas que c'est une façon de dire que les villes sont, euh, euh, sont des espaces où il y a moins d'incidents et de crimes haineux, je pense qu'il y en a vraiment partout. Euh, mais la question de, de la ville, c'est qu'elle concentre 
tellement démographiquement de personnes que ça fait que les incidents et les, les, les crimes eux-mêmes en fait, se, se démultiplient et les espaces de potentiels euh, actes racistes se, se démultiplient. Euh, donc, je, je pense qu'on doit juste regarder les réponses autrement, euh, mais je, je pense que la ville, il y a, y, a, y, a, y, a, y a une façon de, de, on va dire, de comptabiliser tout, tout ce qui se passe et je pense qu'on est souvent dans les villes beaucoup plus outillées pour répondre euh, à ces enjeux-là, alors que dans certaines villes, euh, si je pense au Québec, je sais que la ville de Québec, après l'attentat de Sainte-Foy, donc après l'attentat qui a coûté la vie à six personnes, la ville de Québec a fait tout un travail à l'interne. Ils ont aussi euh, amené quelqu'un, euh, un conseiller stratégique pour les accompagner sur les questions de diversité, comme dirait euh, euh, mon collègue Steven. Euh, mais ce n'est pas directement sur les enjeux de racisme et de discrimination. Mais euh, disons que dans les villes, on a une capacité à voir beaucoup d'événements, mais je pense qu'on est plus outillé parce qu'il y a un écosystème qui est peut-être euh, euh, un peu plus habitué à travailler sur ces questions-là. Merci. Thank you, uh, Bushra. Uh, we do have a question here for uh, Stephen. Um, so Stephen, as a journalist, I'm sure you have lots of thoughts about how our industry requires considerable anti-racist reform. Ro what role do journalism schools play here? And what recommendations do you have for those who lead those schools? It's a good question. Um, I went a couple of years of graduate school and journalism school. Um, I found it to be like, you know, it's, I mean, I'll just be frank. I'll say it's, you know, 50% useful maybe like, and often, you know, this was 10 years ago. So um, obviously, okay. I think the obvious answer is perhaps at the leadership level to have more people of diverse backgrounds. Um, that to me seems to be the easy answer to everything these days. It's a representation issue. Um, although I would say that in the newsroom, I mean, it, what, it, it's all about what happens in the newsroom and what happens at the editorial side when it comes to uh, story ideas and story meetings in the morning, every day or every week or whatever it may be. The way it plays out is that some young people don't feel like the older um, editors or producers respect their ideas. That's because there's a gap between a recognition. Obviously, sometimes there's maybe arrogance from the editors or producers and, you know, but also it's newsrooms are very um, high pressure places and it's a very competitive thing. Um, even between your teammates, there's a tremendous amount of competition. That's just, you know, the times we live in. I mean, journalism is much, it's, it's very acute in journalism. So if you're within leadership positions, perhaps Uh, you should do something to reassure everyone that um, the way it's taught, the way you get stories and so on and so forth is not a, you know, like a fight to the death or whatever the case may be and make people feel more inclusive. And I don't necessarily think that's purely a racial problem, okay, an ethno-racial problem, because plenty of uh, people of color can also be in, uh, be in, leadership positions within the newsroom and also have somewhat abusive tendencies, okay? These things are just internalized, right? Like I was saying, I think the doctor was saying earlier as well. And um, what can you do about that? I think, like I said, you know, we live, we have to fight the fight. You know, I don't know what really that, that means, but um, it negates this uh, kind of hyper-individualistic neoliberal thing that has broken down in recent years uh, that has permeated all institutions because everybody wants to make it. And that um, I think uh, is, is falling apart and we're seeing what's taking its place is a kind of racialist, traditional, you know, I don't want to say traditional, but like far right, often far right racialist revanchism. It's not, uh, that's not a good process. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so we are getting quite tight on time, but we do have one more question here um, for Manel and Dr. Fung. Um, so we have, what should we be teaching newcomers about multiculturalism in Canada? And whoever wants to take a stab at that first. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a good question because, um, 
um, no. for certainly we recognize that uh, um, first of all, immigrants and refugees have their own tremendous challenge of cultural change. I think that's number one. So I think that uh, understanding what it is to come to a new society, the process of what we call acculturation and massive uh, changes would occur. And of course, uh, refugees are still dealing with trauma from the previous. So I think that's number one, is just to even um, and psychologically and also being able to negotiate the new culture. And then as we, as they do get into new culture, uh, a number of things also start to even the complexity of, we know the healthy immigrant effect, which means that we take the healthiest immigrant and then they their health kind of de deteriorates, even though initially they're very high because of all the systemic injustices. So then they could start to really recognize and face with all these uh, issues of racism. And, and this is when a number of things can also happen, including some of the um, uh, different cultural groups may um, even hyper cling on to the original culture instead of uh, adapting uh, or, in, or maybe easily swayed, for example, that other races is your enemy or things like that. I think that's one of the uh, challenges I think that Stephen had alluded to too. Um, because of all these is high pressures. Um, and people come from more homogeneous countries. So it is a huge culture shock and to negotiate. And then, of course, there's the acculturation gap with the newer generation. And that can, again, bring a host of its problems. And we might perhaps sometimes see the older generation hyper. Um, I think you're talking, but you're on mute. I think you're trying to give Manel a chance to speak. Oh, thank you. My, uh, my doorbell actually just rang, so I was just telling my wife to <laughs> go, go answer that. Oh, I was just reading, <laughs> trying to read your lips. Are you saying that I'm, my time is done or something? <laughs> no, no, please, please continue if you have more. So, so that's why I think it's actually a quite a cultural journey um, for the different generations. And, and, um, and this idea of cultural identity and development for the younger generation and also for the older one is to have this idealized mosaic integrated cultural identity is the ideal. Now, scholarly, uh, Barry, a Canadian scholar actually, talk about the different types of acculturation strategies because some groups um, are in their own community, some groups would you know, try to become white, as you will, psychologically, where some groups try to integrate and some groups are no man's land. They feel disconnected and they also feel marginalized. So, and we see that this kinds of individual psychological acculturative change reflected also by societal pressures, communities. We talk about rural versus um, urban, uh, but we also talk about official policy, the policy of multiculturalism. So a lot of different things in politics, it's gonna impact um, on people's acculturated beliefs and also their open acceptance to all different kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, cultural, gender, sexual orientation differences, right? Um, so, there's lots to talk about, but I just really want to give Minel a chance. <laughs> well, I'll follow off of that, um, if I may. Thank you, Ken, for those really thoughtful comments. And thank you, everybody. I've really learned so much today. Um, just quickly, one of the things that I worry about, particularly as someone who teaches a lot of uh, students who are international students at UBC, I really am concerned about the way in which we, um, when we welcome immigrants and refugees to uh, what we call Canada nation state, we tend to focus on all these kinds of what we call 1970s early multiculti, like fun food and festival saris, let's celebrate Canadian national identity, get out your flags and wave them and let's talk about how important that identity is to us. One of the things I've learned in the last little while, which I think is really crucial, as you could probably tell from my talk, is I'm interested in stories and the power of stories. And we ask people to come here and we negate the power of their own stories and the importance of developing those stories in what we're doing, the work that we do here. I've learned a lot here about developing coalitional um, alliances and differences from my best friend, Joy Lynn Chai, who is a teacher, an ESL teacher in the school system in Toronto. And one of the things she's taught me um, with her work with ESL uh, students, mostly adult learners, is the importance of building these kind of coalition alliances and offering a space for newly arrived immigrants and refugees to honor their own stories, to give them a space to remember and honor their stories and their ancestry. And have 
having these stories shared in the classroom, allowing Spake to speak about that, even simple things that she does, like asking the individuals in the classroom, not just to focus on what life is like here in Canada, but remembering what their past was like. Don't negate all that. You're not being asked to throw it under the rug. It's actually space for sharing. And that develops relationships with so many other participants in the class. It's something that I do in my classrooms or try to do. I learned from Joy Lin, who does this so beautifully. And I try to do that in my own classes as well with some of the students who do come in, who often have um, a different kind of experience, obviously um, coming in from different countries. So thank you so much for the response there, uh, Manel and Dr. Fung, and really a big, big thank you to all our panelists. Uh, it was such a rich and diverse session that covered many aspects and components of Islamophobia, what that means to us as a community and a society, and, and really how we need to move forward. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all our participants for staying tuned in a little bit after time. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of uh, your conference and a strong week ahead. Take care, everyone. Thanks for the great moderation. Thanks. Thanks.